all of us have this nagging feeling that the human race is supposed to mean something, that we're here for a reason. We're not just some accident of the universe. So today on Authentic, we're going to go digging in the very ancient past and listen to what our ancestors claimed they knew about the reason that you and I are here. I think perhaps one of the most intriguing questions we could deal with is the matter of who we are, or maybe to be more accurate, what we're supposed to be. Because I, I think we all have this sense that something is not quite right with the way we're doing life right now, and we appear to be pushing toward something better. A few years into our childhood, we begin to discover that life is rather imperfect or even painful, and something deep in our core tells us it's not supposed to be like this. So if you and I are just an accident, the product of particles smashing into each other over billions of years, then where do we get this idea that life could be better? I mean, what if this existence is it? What if you and I are always going to be at war with a universe that doesn't really care about us? A universe that just accidentally coughed us up on the edge of an insignificant spiral galaxy. It's kind of a depressing thought. But then you have to ask yourself, why is that thought depressing? Why is it that we seem to have a sense that something is wrong with this world? I know that our generation tends to think of anything more than a couple of centuries old as archaic and out of touch, as if our ancestors were incapable of pondering these kinds of deep questions in any meaningful or constructive way. But if you take the time to poke around in the writings of people who lived thousands of years ago, you'll notice philosophically speaking, that very little has changed. For example, you and I have this tendency to dismiss the myths of the ancient Greeks or Egyptians as the product of simple minds that didn't have access to our current heightened state of knowledge. So those ancient people just wrote silly little stories to explain the world and what amounts to the language and understanding of a, a kindergartner. I mean, how else do you explain a people that believed the world was flat and actually rested on the shoulders of a giant named Atlas? It, except they didn't believe that. The idea that our ancestors believed the world was flat is actually one of our modern day myths. Back some 500 years before Christ, the Greeks had already figured out that the Earth is a sphere, as you can see from Plato's contemplation on the meaning and the reason for creation. The fact that the ancient Greeks realized that the universe must be here for some kind of purpose is a story in and of itself, but that would likely be a diversion from where we need to go today in the time that we have. So for right now, let me just show you Plato's conception of planet Earth, which comes from his Timaeus dialogue. Here's what he says. For this reason, and by this reasoning, he, that's God, made this world one complete whole consisting of parts that are all holes and subject neither to age nor to disease. That, by the way, just happens to agree with the account you find in the book of Genesis, which tells us that this world we live in used to be a much different place. And if we have time, I'll come back to that thought in just a little bit. Here comes the important part for now. This is Plato again. The shape he gave it, that's God giving the earth a shape, the shape he gave it was suitable and akin to its nature a suitable shape for a living being that was to contain within itself all living beings would be a figure that contains all possible figures within itself. Therefore, he turned it, the earth, into a rounded spherical shape with the extremes equidistant in all directions from the center. Now, what's important to understand here is that the ancient Greeks dabbled in something they knew as sacred geometry, which apparently they picked up from the ancient Egyptians before them. Sacred geometry teaches that shapes and measurements mean something. They reveal something profound about the universe. That's why Pythagoras is famous for more than just his observations on the right triangle. He was studying the shapes you find in the universe, like the five-pointed star that Venus draws in the sky over the course of eight years. 
he tried to attach those shapes to some kind of meaning. Venus, of course, was the planet of desire, and that's at least part of the reason the medieval church came to the conclusion that the forbidden fruit of Eden must have been an apple. It's because the center of an apple, when you cut it in half, also has a five-pointed star, just like the path of Venus. So, what, what Plato is saying is that it only makes sense, at least to him, that the Earth would be a sphere, because every other shape can fit neatly inside a globe, much like the much-revered dodecahedron, a shape you create by putting 12 pentagons together. The Greeks worship this shape practically. It gives you a 12-sided object that fits nicely inside of a sphere. But the real point we need to make is not what the Greeks thought about all those geometric shapes and what they might reveal about the nature of the universe. What we really need to understand is that the Greeks were not making up silly fairy tales because they were such simple people that those stories were all they had. What they were doing was searching for meaning in the universe, just like we do. And the myths they told were actually complicated metaphors designed to convey the meanings they thought they discovered behind the universe. So when they said the world was resting on the shoulders of Atlas, it, it wasn't because they were recovering cavemen in need of a superstitious story. They were creating a metaphor that explained what they considered to be the meaning of human existence and the meaning of the universe at large. And of course, you'll notice that they didn't for one minute believe that the Earth was actually flat. I know that some people think our ancestors believed that idea, but it's just not true. They knew full well it was a sphere. And as early as 240 BC, they actually knew exactly how large that sphere was. It was a Greek mathematician by the name of Eratosthenes who put a stick in the ground at 12 noon on the summer solstice in the city of Alexandria. And he did it because further south in the Egyptian city of Syene, he noticed that the sun was directly overhead at 12 noon on the solstice because when he looked down a well at that precise moment, his head completely blocked the reflection of the sun. He also knew that Alexandria was 5,000 stadia to the north, or about 570 miles. And when he put that stick in the ground at 12 noon there, it cast a shadow that reached 7 degrees and 12 minutes from the top of the stick. 7 degrees and 12 minutes is roughly 1 50th of a circle. So he multiplied 5,000 stadia by 50, and he got the circumference of the planet. And he was accurate to within 100 miles. So, this idea that our ancestors were unsophisticated bumpkins who told unsophisticated stories because they didn't know better, well, it might just be that we're the ones who are busy telling fairy tales. I mean, it's very tempting to think that human knowledge is always tracking upwards, that it's improving because our species is always improving. And in some regards, that might be a little bit true. We really have advanced in terms of technology. But when it comes to contemplating the nature of human existence and the reason we're here, we might have to concede the point that our ancestors were hardly less sophisticated than we are. In fact, in some ways, we might be the simpletons. Which brings me to another ancient record that, again, many people dismiss as nothing but a fairy tale. Another so-called unsophisticated record of human origins that doesn't make sense anymore in a scientifically enlightened world. And of course, I'm talking about the Bible, a body of ancient literature that has helped shape the pillars of Western civilization. If you want to weigh the relative impact of the Greeks and the Hebrews on our civilization, I'd have to argue that the Hebrews are at least half of the picture, if not more. So here's what we're going to do right now. We're going to take a really quick break because that's how things work around here. And then you might want to grab pen and paper while I'm on break because you're about to see an amazing offer from the good people at The Voice of Prophecy. Then I'll be right back to examine what this old book says about the nature of your existence. Dragons, beasts, cryptic statues. Bible prophecy can be incredibly vivid and confusing. If you've ever read Daniel or Revelation and come away scratching your head, you're not alone. Our free Focus on Prophecy guides are designed to help you unlock the mysteries of the Bible and deepen your understanding of God's plan for you and our world. 
Study online or request them by mail and start bringing prophecy into focus today. Are you searching for answers to life's toughest questions like, where is God when we suffer? Can I find real happiness? Or is there any hope for our chaotic world? The Discover Bible Guides will help you find the answers you're looking for. Visit us at BibleStudies.com or give us a call at 888-456-7933 for your free Discover Bible Guides. Study online on our secure website or have the free guides mailed right to your home. There is never a cost or obligation. The Discover Bible Guides are our free gift to you. Find answers and guides like, Does My Life Really Matter to God? and A Second Chance at Life. You'll find answers to the things that matter most to you in each of the 26 Discover Bible Guides. Visit BibleStudies.com and begin your journey today to discover answers to life's deepest questions. One man, one woman, a tree, and a talking serpent. It all seems kind of silly to some people with our 21st century mindset until you start reading the story itself and you see what it says about who we are. What I thought I would do today is just touch down on a number of highlights from the first three chapters of Genesis and you see if they don't make sense. But before we get started, I want to point out just one important detail. Even though people today tend to lump this story in with the myths of Greece, Rome, and Egypt, we should probably notice that it doesn't read like a myth. It has this factual, no-nonsense tone to the narrative that makes it seem, well, more real. In fact, the rest of the Bible provides blow-by-blow genealogies of people we know for sure were absolutely real. And they can be traced all the way back without missing a beat to the story of the Garden of Eden. So, if we're going to treat Eden as nothing but an unsophisticated myth, we've got a bit of a problem. You have to look at those lists of very real people, like the one you find in Luke chapter 3. And if you insist that Adam was nothing but a myth, you're going to have to draw a line somewhere in that genealogy and say, on this side of the line, the people are real, but on that side, well, they're all fictitious. So, I'll leave that for you to think about, but what's really important for our study today is that we notice the tone of Genesis is radically different than the stories that come from Mount Olympus. This is not a pantheon of capricious, arbitrary gods amusing themselves by toying with the human race. It's a simple story, the story of a divine creator and the world that he made. This story is just qualitatively different. So, what kinds of things can we learn from the story of Genesis? What does it say about the nature of human existence? Well, the first thing we discover is that human beings were made in the image of God. Here's what it says. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, to be honest, there is no way in the time that we have that we could unpack what it really means to be created in God's image. That's something that theologians have been discussing for hundreds of years, and I could probably do a mini-series on the conversations that they've had. So for now, let's just consider a few things that are obvious from the story itself. First of all, human thinkers have long suspected that somehow this planet we live on exists for our sake. Now, I know that's an idea that drives people crazy in the 21st century, where a lot of people hate the idea that human beings might be in charge of this planet. They criticize that idea because of the way we treat the planet like it's some kind of disposable resource. And to some extent, I'd have to agree. The planet really has paid a terrible price for what amounts to human selfishness. We pollute the air, we pollute the water, we strip the earth of its resources without any real consideration for the future, and of course we're littering the beaches with our plastic. Our domination of this planet has been very problematic. And the Bible actually acknowledges this and describes it as a perversion of the original order. 
The book of Genesis says we were given dominion over the planet, but then the rest of the Bible describes how we twisted our dominion into something terrible. The fact remains, however, that we have always had this sense that the world was put here for us. And, and, and PETA aside, we've also had this sense that you and I are somehow qualitatively different from the other beings who live on this planet. I mean, it's hard to deny that people are different than animals. The way the Bible describes it is that we were made in the image of God. And I understand that some of you might not believe in God, but here's what I want you to consider. All of us have a sense that we're supposed to be better than the way we are. We realize there's something wrong when people use each other to their own advantage. We know there's something wrong when people oppress other people and do a thousand other terrible things. So you've got to wonder why it is that we think we're supposed to be better than we are. I mean, if we really are just the product of accidental organic material producing life, then why should we care about being better? Why not just be happy with a tooth and claw existence? I mean, it is what it is, right? Survival of the fittest. Except that at a fundamental level, that bothers us. The idea of a few powerful people dominating everybody else just seems wrong because we understand that human beings aren't supposed to be this way. The way that Genesis describes it, we were made in the image of God. We were created to reflect something greater and bigger and higher and better than our current state. Somehow, we're supposed to transcend this current existence and become something more. So again, you might not believe that this story is literally true. I happen to think it is. But you'd still have to admit that the concepts you find in this narrative run deeper than primitive superstition. Whoever wrote this book knew something about human nature. So now let's look at another key passage, this time from Genesis chapter 2, where it says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. What I want you to notice is that this account doesn't end by explaining how we got here. It also reveals what we were created to do. We were made to tend to the creation, to do creative work, which is also a big part of what it means to be made in the Creator's image. You know, one of the most intriguing video games ever created is Minecraft, because it gives you an entire planet of block-shaped wilderness and then invites you to mold and shape it into something a little more organized. You can build houses, dig for minerals, cut down trees, put up fences and gardens, and even build working machines. And I think one of the reasons that Minecraft has been so successful is the fact that it taps into a basic human impulse, this irresistible instinct we have to tame the world around us. I mean, just take a bunch of kids, put them in a sandbox and watch what happens. Before too long, they're making roads and houses and mountains. Give a kid a pile of Lego and you're going to get a car or a house or something creative. Human beings are not bottom feeders on this planet, happy to slurp up a little nutrition from the ooze. We appear to have higher instincts and an irresistible urge to create. We don't just want shelter. We want a house, a home, with a yard or a garden. And we love to make our own little corner of the planet seem, well, more orderly. So whoever wrote this biblical account was obviously aware of our most basic emotional instincts. And we'd be foolish to dismiss this story too quickly. This is not a fairy tale. It's a perceptive account of who we are. And there's so much more. But right now I'm up against another break, so don't go away. I'm just getting warmed up and I'll be right back to create something else. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we're committed to creating top quality programming for the whole family, like our audio adventure series, Discovery Mountain. Discovery Mountain is a Bible-based program for kids of all ages and backgrounds. Your family will enjoy the faith-building stories from this small mountain summer camp and town. With 24 seasonal episodes every year and fresh content every week, there's always a new adventure just on the horizon. Let me show you a little part of the Genesis story that I find absolutely fascinating because it's such a good description of who we are. This comes from Genesis chapter 3 now, where the first humans have broken their agreement with God and they have compromised the original created order, which led to the mess we live in today. 
Now God asks them what they've done and why they did it. Here's what it says. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So here we find the concepts of shame and guilt, which wouldn't make sense in a world that happened by accident. If you and I are nothing but biological machines, then why ever feel guilty? I mean, if someone's standing in your way, kill them. If someone has something you want, take it. Except for some reason, we know there's a right and wrong way to live, and when we do things the wrong way, we find ourselves compelled to cover our tracks. I remember talking to a guy who spent some time in a Nazi labor camp, and he somehow managed to escape. And when you asked him how he escaped, he would suddenly fall quiet. He would tear up, and he would refuse to talk about it. Rumor was that he and his friends actually killed a Nazi guard in order to escape. And that was something that haunted him the rest of his life, even though it seemed perfectly justified given the circumstances. So you've got to ask yourself this question, why does something like the death of a stranger bother us? When we see a video of some horrific crime circulating on social media, like those young girls who stole a car in D.C. and ended up killing the driver, why does that make our stomach churn? How is it that we have a moral sense of right and wrong, and why do we struggle with guilt when we do the wrong thing? Again, you might not believe the Bible, but I still want you to notice that the opening chapters deal with the reality of human existence in a very compelling way. Now, in chapter 3, verse 11, God suddenly asked Adam why he was hiding, and I want you to notice what happens. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So, so what we have here is the first recorded instance of passing the buck. When God asks Adam what he did, he does something that almost every parent has seen. He blames somebody else. It's really this woman you, who did this. It's not me, says Adam. But then he also says, It's this woman you gave me, God. So in other words, absolutely everybody else is to blame for what happened, including God. And that gives us a couple of really good insights into the way that human beings are wired. First of all, we know there's a right and a wrong way to live. And when we do the wrong thing, we know instinctively that something has to be done. There has to be some kind of justice. It's not good enough to say what happened was bad. We also understand that it has to somehow be made right. And of course, we don't want to be the ones to pay the price, so we point to somebody else. We blame the government. We blame our neighbors. We blame another country or another culture or another people group. We even blame God in an attempt to shift the spotlight off of self. And you have to wonder where in the world that comes from. Why do we seem to have so much trouble owning what we've done? And why do we have millions of pages of philosophers wrestling with the concept of justice and why we seem to have such a hard time finding it. It's pretty obvious that the Bible is not the work of simpletons who needed a story to fill the gaps in their scientific knowledge. They were wrestling with the same questions that bother us to this day. And the fact that Adam blames God for this, well, that might just uncover the biggest question in the universe. If there is a God, why in the world would he allow so much pain and suffering? Every time you and I see something we think is wrong and we say, that shouldn't happen, we're dipping into this overwhelming belief that some kind of moral order has been violated. Or we're dipping into the belief, like the early Christian Gnostics, that whoever made this place must have made a huge mistake, and maybe the Creator isn't perfect. Here in Genesis, you find that same question laid out as plain as day. And you can see that God didn't violate the covenant with humanity. We violated that covenant. God warned us not to do this. He told us what would happen if we did it. And we did it anyway. And then we blame God. And for the next 926 chapters, the authors of the Bible unpack that concept in painstaking detail. If God really is good, then why do we suffer? Which, of course, leads us to the ultimate question, of death. I'll be right back after this. Life can throw a lot at us. 
sometimes we don't have all the answers. But that's where the Bible comes in. It's our guide to a more fulfilling life. Here at The Voice of Prophecy, we've created the Discover Bible Guides to be your guide to the Bible. They're designed to be simple, easy to use, and provide answers to many of life's toughest questions. And they're absolutely free. So jump online now or give us a call and start your journey of discovery. I think of all the issues that bother us the most, death is quite handily at the top of the list. And even though the thinkers, the philosophers of the 19th century wanted us to believe that life is pretty much meaningless and that death is just a natural part of life, there's something in the human psyche that refuses to let us just accept that idea. We logically know that we're going to die. We all will. But somehow that seems unacceptable. And you've got to wonder, why is it unacceptable? What you find in the pages of the Bible is not some pat answer, but a careful and detailed explanation for why death bothers us so much. And I know, we're basically out of time this week, and all I've really managed to do is raise a whole bunch of questions that we're not going to be able to explore easily or quickly. Questions like, why does the human race feel like it's special? What sense does that make if we're an accident? Why do we feel like we should be morally better than we currently are? Why do we, on the one hand, struggle with the concept of justice and then refuse justice when everybody else wants to apply it to us? Why does life have to be so painful? And why does the idea of dying bother us at a really core level? I mean, why would that bother us if we're really just another animal? Believe me. That's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the questions, the real questions that the Bible deals with. And I guess what I want to do today is this. I mean, I would love to unpack those in greater detail. We could spend hours and hours on those questions, but what I want you to do is discover the answers for yourself. I want to dare you to read this book. I know people make fun of the Bible today. I know you've been told it's a myth, it's a fairy tale, it belongs on Mount Olympus. But maybe, just maybe, it's time to have a look for yourself. Why would you let the naysayers who have never read this book cheat you from what might be one of the most profound experiences of your life? Pick up a Bible. I think you're going to be blown away by what you find is in here. Thanks for joining me again this week. I'm Sean Boonstrom. You've been watching Authentic. Mm -hmm.